Hi, I'm Umbreon Libris, and welcome to Chapter 3, the final chapter of my grand theory of Pokémon breeding and genetics, where I attempt to explain everything we know so far about Pokémon reproduction and some related topics. If you haven't seen Chapters 1 or 2, where I establish the core of this theory, make sure to click here or the links in the description to watch those first. This chapter relies heavily on those. Now that we've established how Pokémon reproduction works in most cases, I want to cover some related topics and then go over the specifics of some of the weirder Pokémon species. Species is not the only characteristic that causes problems for us. IVs, nature, and ability also have at least the potential of being directly inherited, depending on held items, which are basically environmental factors. But the problem is the randomness. There is randomness in selecting which IVs get inherited and in setting the ones that aren't. There's randomness in deciding when an ability gets inherited, or in setting the ability or the nature when they aren't. There's randomness in shiny Pokémon too, since shininess nowadays is never inherited. Wait, we could manipulate that and think of it as uh, dominant, recessive characteristics, um, or even uh, things with codominance that would be a third intermediate option usually, but it could be incomplete dominance where a little of this, a little of that is displayed and not a mix, not a, a watered-down version. And in some cases, maybe something more of a polygenic inheritance, like for skin color and things like this, where it's not black or white, you know, you have all... Um, everything in the middle. But the stats of the offspring, at least the ones that are randomized, have nothing to do with the stats of the parents. For new characteristics that were not there before, just arising, either we're talking about parents who are both heterozygous for something, and then the homozygous recessive trait appears, and it seems like something that was not seen before, but it was actually there maybe in some previous generation. Except that's not quite what we see in practice either. You could have an entire lineage of max attack IV Pokemon, and then suddenly have an offspring born with zero attack IV. It is possible. Maybe if you go way back to when the Pokemon were wild, there could be some variants there. We don't know the stats of the parents of wild Pokemon, so that could be it. If it's totally brand new in that family, I would say a mutation. Mutations happen and new traits appear, which is why we now have the current diversity of living things on the planet. Now I like that idea a little bit more because a high degree of mutation between generations of Pokemon would help account for the incredible variety and adaptability of Pokemon that we see. Although it would also get in the way of the whole interbreeding and transforming thing, so maybe the mutations are actually epigenetic changes? How about Pokerus, a virus that can infect any Pokemon? It is common for viruses to be able to infect um, several species. From what I know, it's more common that they'll infect, for example, several different kinds of mammals, you know, and not a wider range. So if a virus can infect hundreds of different species, you'd expect those species to be fairly similar genetically. Yeah, fairly similar. I'm trying to think of whether there is any kind of virus that can infect both plants and animals. I can't think of anything right now. So that, again, supports the idea of all Pokémon being very closely related. The other important aspect of Pokerus is that it actually has a beneficial effect for the host Pokémon. It causes them to gain extra EVs in battle, or let's say it causes them to build extra muscle more quickly, or something like that. And that is possible, at least, in real life. The virus could cause, or the immune response to the virus, could cause an increased production of a growth hormone, for example. I don't see why not. I don't have examples to offer you. But I don't see why not. Let's get back to talking about reproduction itself. Legendary Pokémon not being able to reproduce is a common question, but to me it's also a fairly simple answer. 
And by the way, when I say legendary Pokemon, I mean all categories of legendary and mythical Pokemon. I don't think the distinctions are important in this discussion. You can believe that all legendary Pokemon do in fact possess all of the legendary attributes that are ascribed to them. In which case, legendary Pokemon can't breed because they're not normal Pokemon. Only one of them exists and will ever exist, at least in most cases. But that's not the explanation that I like. There are some legendary Pokemon that we see multiples of, like the Cosmog family in Sun and Moon. And it's even harder to accept that explanation now that we know about regional forms of legendary Pokemon, since we know there are at least two, Articuno, Zapdos, and Moltres. The egg group that includes almost all legendary Pokemon is called No Eggs Discovered, which implies not that the eggs are impossible, but they've just never been found. The group also includes baby Pokemon, which are presumably just too immature and can reproduce later after they evolve. It also includes chimeric Pokemon like Type Null or the Galar fossils that are made up of parts of other Pokemon. They are incomplete Pokemon, so it makes sense that they are not able to reproduce. The Pokemon that their parts come from probably could. There's also Ultra Beasts, which are sort of legendary Pokemon in our world, but in their own worlds they can be pretty common, like Poipole being a starter. So I think that the only reason they or any of the true legendary Pokemon are in this egg group is just that we have not seen them reproduce. They are very rare Pokemon, some of them barely known to science. And it may just be that some of them require a very specific breeding environment, or they have a really bizarre courtship ritual. We don't know how they reproduce, but because absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, it doesn't mean that they can't. Which I think is why Mew is not shown to reproduce with anything, even though it has very nearly the same genetic versatility that Ditto does. It probably can breed, considering the Mewtwo journals and Cinnabar mention Mew giving birth, but Mew just isn't well studied enough for us to know how it reproduces. And we do know at least two legendary Pokemon that actually can reproduce, Manaphy and Fione. These two are considered part of the Water One and Fairy egg groups, but they are genderless, so just like any regular genderless Pokemon, they can only breed with Ditto. As you probably know, Manaphy and Fione have a very strange relationship. When Manaphy breed with Ditto, its offspring is Fione. Fione cannot evolve into Manaphy, but Fione can also breed with Ditto to produce more Fione. Although Manaphy is obtained as an egg, it's a very unique egg, but still an egg, meaning it must have been produced by something else. I don't think we have enough information to figure out exactly how this works, but within the paradigm that we established earlier, we know that either Manaphy or Fione can only pass down one copy of their G species chromosome. So when breeding with Ditto, the offspring will always end up as a G0. But what if Manaphy's development actually requires two copies of the species chromosome, a GG? Maybe despite being genderless, Manaphy actually can reproduce sexually. Maybe all genderless Pokemon can, it's just rare or something. And so two copies of the Manaphy G chromosome produces a fully fledged Manaphy, but a single copy produces a Fione. Something else that hints that Ditto's ability to reproduce isn't directly tied to its ability to transform is that Ditto is able to transform into Pokemon that it can't breed with, including Pokemon that are presumably infertile. And by extension, so can all other Pokemon that are capable of transforming in some way. But if the ability to transform is tied to having the complete genome of all Pokemon, how come Ditto can transform into Pokemon that aren't entirely natural, or at all. Ditto can transform into chimeric Pokemon like Silvalla and the Galar fossils that are made up of parts of other Pokemon. It can also transform into Pokemon that have been modified by modern science, like Mewtwo and Genesect, and even the non-Galar fossils, if you accept the idea that their rock typing is just a product of having been revived from a fossil. And it can even transform into Porygon, a species that is entirely artificial, or at least we're told it is. Remember how Pokemon species are incredibly close, genetically speaking, to the point that most of the differences between them can just come down to epigenetics, to turning certain genes on or off. So what if the Pokemon genome is so versatile that all of those unnatural variations are actually within the realm of possibility just with epigenetic changes? Take Genesect, for example. 
It's supposed to have been revived from a fossil and upgraded by Team Plasma. I don't think the extent of the modifications is known, but an exoskeleton that becomes metallic? That's just Scyther evolving into Scizor. A cannon? Well, Blastoise has those. And oh, look at that. Both Scizor and Blastoise can breed with Araquanid, which doesn't have either of those features, but it does show that they have a decent degree of genetic similarity, or epigenetic similarity. So if that's the case, that explains why Ditto would be able to transform into Pokémon that it has never seen before, that have never even existed before. Ditto just has such fine control over its epigenetics, it can just flip the necessary genes on or off, even in totally new combinations. Which also explains how it can transform into chimeric Pokémon. It's basically doing partial transformations. That phenotypic plasticity that I mentioned in Chapter 2? This is where it really shines, because just like our immune system is able to create antibodies for even novel antigens, Ditto is able to adjust its phenotype to mimic its opponent, even in novel ways. This could even be how the Ditto 5 of Koni Koni City are able to pass as humans. I have no good reason to think humans are Pokémon, so there's also no good reason Ditto would have the human genome within its own, and the Ditto 5 don't quite accomplish perfect transformations, like they can't copy the human voice, but they might be able to accomplish the look of humans just externally through very fine control of its epigenetics. Or they could be doing some shenanigans with abilities like Illusion from Zorua and Zoroark. Another weird quirk of Pokémon reproduction, as if there weren't enough of those already, is incense, an item that creates a nice, relaxing environment and causes Pokémon to produce offspring that are born at an earlier stage than normal. For example, in normal situations, a pair of Snorlax will create eggs that hatch into more Snorlax. But give the parents a full incense, and they will start producing eggs that hatch as Munchlax instead. This is not something we see in nature. I don't know of any any living things out there that um, have this option, let's say, because I keep going back to metamorphosis and larval stages and that, but that's, then it's always that way. I'm even, I'm trying to think, I'm, I'm growing a bunch of plants here, and I'm trying to think of, of examples from plants, maybe, because they are so different, right? But, no. A seed will grow into a seedling that will grow into something or not, but that's it. It's almost like the incense is causing the offspring to hatch prematurely at an earlier stage of development than it normally would. Except that premature babies can't really survive that well without neonatal care and modern medicine. Whereas Munchlax and other premature baby Pokémon can stay in that form indefinitely. So it's more like a frog that is normally born as a frog being sometimes born as a tadpole, but it can stay as a tadpole indefinitely as long as the environmental factors for metamorphosis don't happen. It doesn't make any sense, so we might have to give that one up to the magical side of Pokémon. Take it to Zeus, together with Ditto. Alright, I think we're done with the bizarre puzzles. The last few are kind of easy to explain. For example, the male Nidorans being able to reproduce at any stage in their development, while the females are only fertile in the earliest stage, the one that's usually also the youngest. But that's actually quite common in real life, too. It's sort of this way with humans, right? When girls are born, they are already born with all the potential eggs that might eventually one day be fertilized and become their baby. Men produce healthy, viable sperm almost throughout their whole life, or sometimes throughout their whole life, and I mean to old age, okay? Uh, sperm counts re is reduced and that, but not zeroed um, in healthy males. While the females were born with all those eggs, right? Uh, so these eggs are getting old. Males are producing fresh sperm all the time. The females are maturing those eggs that are getting older and older and older because they're as old as that woman is. So the chances of a miscarriage, the chances of other kinds of problems increases a lot between 30 and 40. And after 40, um, it's pretty much 
done in terms of reproduction. I know you're talking about a much younger stage, um, but it's kind of an exaggeration of this uh, discrepancy in males and females, and it could provide a fair explanation of why uh, the females are only fertile at a younger age. There are even some species where the older females of that species, rather than spending their energy making more babies themselves, instead put their energy into childcare. So you might have the female nidoran producing eggs, while the nidorina and nidoqueen of the group focus instead on feeding the young or protecting their den or something like that. Yeah, it does make sense. Um, in a species where the male is not equally invested in raising their young, and the male is invested again in quantity. What about Pokemon that hatch right out of the egg holding an item, an object that does not appear to be part of its own body, like a far-fetched or a cubone? Or even ones that gain an item later on, like a Kadabra or a Hypno, could those be natural? Because we literally see them hatch or evolve already holding those items. So no matter what the lore says, Cubone is already born holding bones. I've dedicated an entire video to Cubone and I recommended you check that out, but ultimately, the way that Cubone functions within the game, not the lore, but actually what we see happen, suggests that the mother's skull is just a natural part of Cubone's head that just happens to look like a skull. But that doesn't really explain the bone that it holds, because that is a separate thing. It doesn't look like it's part of the body. Except, what if it is? What if the bone that it holds grew as a part of the skull and then broke off? Imagine a rhinoceros beetle having one of its horns break off and then using it as a tool. The same could apply to Kadabra and Alakazam spoons, or Hypno's pendulum, or Farfetch's leak although that one is a little bit harder to imagine. They grow from the body, break off, and then get used as tools. That would have to happen super quickly, either as the egg develops and hatches or as the Pokemon evolves, but again, that is the magic of Pokemon. And after talking about Cubone, what better than to talk about Kangaskhan? It is one of the weirdest Pokemon when it comes to questions about Pokemon reproduction. Not only is it an all-female species, but it has a baby in its pouch. This Pokemon doesn't evolve at all, meaning that as soon as Kangaskhan hatches, it already has the baby in the pouch. And the only time it doesn't have a baby in its pouch is when that baby jumps out to fight alongside the parent when they Mega Evolve. Kangaskhan is the parent Pokemon, and everything the Pokedex says is about how it's a mother and her baby. But a baby that is born at the same time as the parent? With the same stat distributions and natures and everything? A baby that never grows up? Besides Mega Evolution, which doesn't count because it's temporary? Look, whatever the Pokedex may say about it, these two are not mother and daughter. They are sisters. Genetically identical twin sisters. I guess, yeah. Can't think of anything else. And you do have many situations where one of the twins develops more than the other. It could be just that a baby is born bigger than the other, that is born smaller, but it could also be so extreme that the other twin actually dies even before birth. The Kangaskhan baby isn't a baby. It's a less developed twin Kangaskhan. Something about Kangaskhan development causes consistent twinning, and one always develops fully while the other one doesn't. The bigger twin then takes in the smaller one and cares for it in a way that people mistake for or misinterpret as parental care when it's in fact fraternal care. Well, this is it. This is the end of chapter 3 and of my grand theory of Pokemon breeding and genetics. If you have any questions about this chapter, as usual, leave them in the comments and I'll answer what I can. I think I covered everything, but I probably didn't, so if there's anything important that I missed, or if there's something that I need to cover in more detail, let me know, and maybe I'll make a follow-up video, an epilogue, if you will. Thank you for watching, I know this has been a lot. And thank you, of course, to my mom for her insight and expertise. Alright, but this was yeah. interesting. Now I know a lot more about Pokemon. <laughs> and if you've learned something too, 
I would love to know. Maybe I've even earned your subscription. Thank you to my patrons, especially luxury patron Ethan Saffron, and I also want to specifically thank Leah a Nerd and Gano Hasanbegovic, who took the time to watch a rough cut of this theory and gave me some very valuable advice. I'm Umbrian Libris. I'll see you in the next chapter.